Welcome to the Miami Day College Journals and Speaker Series. I'm your host, Manolo Barco. We have today with us Alex Mena, the sports editor for El Nuevo and the Miami Herald. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's, as you know, it's a great honor to have you here. Uh, you are an NDC alum, uh, former classmate. Um, you were a year ahead of me, uh, and you were the editor of the paper here at Miami Dade. Talk to me a little bit um, of, of, of that time here at Miami Dade, how much of a, a growth that was for you. Well, to me, it was a, a very exciting time. You know, it was like I had just started doing uh, the, the newspaper thing at, you know, at high school. My senior year is the first time that I ever did any of that stuff. And then when I came to Miami Day, the first thing I did is let me go find the journalism classes and, and the, you know, the college newspaper and see if I can get involved. And coincidentally, when I got there, uh, the sports editor had just been, uh, you know, name, you know, the editor in chief and they didn't have a sports editor. And I figured, well, you were the sports editor at your high school. So why don't you become our sports editor? And, uh, you know, and that's really how I got my start, you know, with David Mervis as the advisor who, you know, who, who I found very, very helpful through my time, you know, Miami Dade. And as a matter of fact, I think that he has had more of a, of an impact in my life than any other person that I could, that I could tell you, because he's wow. the one that actually uh, got me involved in the Miami Herald. Um, I didn't realize that he knew one of the assistant sports editors who was hiring clerks. You know, so I'm, you know, 19 years old, David comes up to me, uh, tells me uh, they are hiring clerks at the Miami Herald. They don't pay a lot, but it's a good way to get in, foot in, in, the door, in yeah. you know, my foot in the door. And at the time, I, you know, I was the assistant manager at Subway. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I'm making five foot 25 an hour. I don't want to go, you know, work for $4 an hour. It doesn't make any sense. And then over the next few weeks, it kind of convinced me that it was the right thing to do. And... Um, that was in 94. Wow. So what is that, about 26 years later, here I am still the Miami Herald. So, you know, so really Miami Day, it is the reason that I am where I'm at, you know, especially because of David and, and his advice and, and help through the years. So that must have been a great experience. Here you are, this young guy, I'm assuming about 18, 19 years yeah. old, and you're sitting there in the Miami Herald newsroom and you're seeing all these people that, someone uh, who wants to be a, a, in the sports field, yeah. uh, seeing all these great writers. and. T talk to me a little bit about that, learning from them and how they do their business. Well, to me, it was like just very, very exciting, a little bit nerve wracking. You know, a little kid, <laughs> you know, with the great Edwin Pope that had been, you know, the Herald sports editor since the 70s. And I'm there, you know, 19 years old at the time and and just kind of being around that atmosphere and, and you know, knowing that there's an office that's right now it's empty because Edwin is out somewhere doing something. It was just kind of one of those exciting things to see Greg Cody for the first time, you know, people that you were reading and you were a fan of and, and now you're seeing them, you know, as a colleague, even though I'm a clerk answering phones and doing whatever else that they want me to do, but just to know that I could talk to this great reporters, Dan Lebator, you know, Clark Spencer and, and, you know, and people like that who, who have you know, been there for years and, and done what they do really well, you know, and, and been mentors to many other reporters, editors, clerks. And, and I think that the atmosphere that we had at the Miami Herald and we still do is of, of a family and, and it's kind of helped me as well. That, that's fantastic. One of the things that's always struck me about you was your work ethic. I remember being a younger, like I said, I was a year, maybe a year, a year behind you, uh, and I would see, like, this guy works really hard. Um, and obviously you've taken advantage of the situations and opportunities you've had at the Miami Herald and, and other publications. Talk to me a little bit about the diversity or the variety of things, because you've, you've done a lot of different things, right? I've, I've done a lot of, actually, while I was, you know, getting my degree, uh, you know, once I, I got my AA from Miami Dade College and I went to FIU, that kind of opened up a little more opportunities of making money because I could become a substitute teacher for the for the county. <laughs> uh, so in a crazy way, at, at one point in my life, you know, I was working at night at the you know the Miami Herald, you know, full time as a clerk, 40 hours a week, and then I was the editor in chief at the Beacon at FIU. Uh, on off days, I was substitute teaching, wow. so I was kind of there was no free time for me to do anything. It was just kind of go go go, um, and I think that kind of opened my eyes to a lot of different things around the world and not just kind of sports or news, um, but just kind of struggles that people go through, you know, through their lives. And that, that's one of the reasons that I try to do more than just sports, you know, and in my career, you know, I've worked in news, I've worked in, you know, in neighbors, so I've been a designer, copy editor, uh, content editor now, you know, for the past four years. Well, 
I've been almost a sports editor now for about a year and a half, but four years before that was the news editor of the Miami Herald, which I was the first Hispanic to, to have that title, and I was very proud to, to, to have done that, you know, to, to be the first Hispanic to, to kind of run the print production of the Miami Herald. You know, it was kind of one of those things that yeah. you don't think about until later that you're like, wow, I, I did that. You know, and and now I'm I'm the sports editor. You know, not just of the Miami Herald, the Nuevo Herald, and I'm also uh, running the major uh, events for McClatchy, the the chain that owns the Miami Herald. So um, right now I'm coordinating March Madness coverage for the entire chain, all you know, 28 newspapers. So what we're going to be doing is uh, basically providing content for everyone. You know, in a in a localized place between mm -hmm. three different. Uh, uh, newspapers, Kansas City, the Miami Herald, and uh, Columbia, you know, the state in Columbia. So it's kind of exciting that I'm able to do all of that stuff. So Alex, elaborate a little bit more about working on the news side and how important it is to get a different, um, a taste of something a little bit different. Well, for me, it was very important because then, you know, I had been doing sports for such a long time that getting the different experience of, of kind of just seeing how a different department handles the news you know, than the way we do it, I think was very, very important to me because it kind of helped us uh, to understand not, in a sense, the sense of urgency, because obviously in sports everything happens now and there is a sense of urgency, but a sense of different type of urgency that news does happen throughout the day. There is no time where we can, you know, we can say that nobody's looking for something, you know, online. You know, this is where we kind of learned that we need to kind of have something for the audience throughout the day, not just when sporting events happen, you know, after six o'clock, which obviously most of the sporting events do happen late. Um, but it, it taught me the importance to kind of have something different for the readers to have uh, throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And also, it was kind of like really interesting and, and kind of mind blowing for me uh, when the you know presidential elections happened. And I actually was running 1A when we elected a new president, you know, and, and it's just that the whole thing was seems surreal for me. I remember being there at 2.45 in the morning and me f kind of talking to the Metro editor saying, all right, we're not going to have anybody call the election, so I think we need to send everybody home. We're done. Wow. 2.45 a.m. Uh, about 2.48 a.m., we have a president. Everybody come back. <laughs> so, you know, we, we ended up having the, you know, the, the news, the next day's newspaper, and, and just being able to kind of be part of that and write the headline, it, it was just, again, surreal for me. It sounds like you were reading. Um, we're going to take a momentary break, and we'll return with Alex Mann of the Miami Herald. Story at MDC. Be analytical. Be imaginative. Be a rising star. Be bold. Be connected. Be the solution. Be ready. What's your story? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Alex is uh, Samuel Freeman's Letters to a Young Journalist. Um, talk to me a little bit about what would you tell your 18-year-old, 19-year-old self uh, with what you've accumulated, the knowledge you've accumulated over the past year? I would certainly say that hard work does pay off because um, it's taken me a long time to get to where I am and it really happened because of, of, of putting in the time, working hard. Um, often, you know, you kind of have to do a little bit more than it's expected of you. Um, certainly, I felt that way, you know, as, a, as an immigrant uh, coming here and having to learn a second language and being able to, to understand w was kind of like difficult for me. I had to like self-teach myself it's the certain things that you learn when you're here in second or third grade. You know, I didn't come here until I was in fifth grade, uh, so there were a lot of things I missed out. And, and I would say that never, never give up because if certainly I could do it, anyone can. It's just a matter of of working hard and listening to the right people and taking the right opportunities and, and not missing out on your chances to do the, the right thing. Like just because you're comfortable at a certain time in your life 
uh, you shouldn't take an opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, I didn't want to be a clerk at the Miami Herald, you know, but it was a great opportunity that if I had just decided to stay in the comfort level where I was, I don't think I would ever reach, you know, the, the point where I'm at right now. So I'm sure the Herald is happy that you were in uh, the Herald management, not the uh, subway uh, management. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's a, a good choice. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, you mentioned this a little bit about mentors. Who mm -hmm. have been some of your mentors in your career? And uh, what is the best advice that you can, that you can remember being given? Well, I mean, one of, one of my first mentors was, you know, David Mervis, the professor here at Miami-Dade uh, College, who uh, kind of pushed me into, into working for the sports department, you know, and, and, you know, his advice was always very valuable to me. You know, and I always remember the hard work that, you know, he said it was required to, to do the right things, you know, and I think he's one of the ones that I always remember throughout my career. And that, that's always stuck with me, you know, the things that, that he would do more so than the things that he would say, because he was always there. He was always, <laughs> you knew that he, 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 he could be depended on, and, and that's the type of person I wanted to be. I wanted to be somebody that could be depended on by others. And, and for me, leading by example is certainly the, the best way that you could teach others. And, and at what point did you know this was your calling? This is what you were meant to do? Um, and was there a pivotal moment when you said, hey, yes, my, your aha moment maybe? Well, I guess my, my aha moment was kind of a, a, a weird type of thing. <laughs> it was sort of school is in the way of me doing more of the Miami Herald, so I need to switch my... Uh, my degree to something that I that, that I think will help me spend more time at work, so I switched from journalism to political science at FIU. Um, actually, even before I, I left Miami Data, I had switched to political science, and I think I, within a year and a half of being in Miami Data, I kind of realized that I really really loved working, you know, for newspaper industry now, really in media, online, and newspaper, and I think that was the moment where I realized I want to do this when I coincidentally switched. Uh, you know, my, my field from journalism to political science when I realized I wanted to be a journalist, if that makes any sense. Well, that's all relative. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, newsrooms. So a lot of newsrooms are downsizing. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, industry is in turmoil. Um, but what would you tell to someone who's a young person that is interested, who's studying journalism, or is interested in a career uh, in the field, um, to, you know, to hang in there? I, I would say definitely hang in there because, you know, as newsrooms are shrinking in some ways, we're expanding in other ways because our, our reach right now, you know, is far greater than it has ever been. Even in the heydays of the newspaper industry, we were not reaching as many people as we are right now. You know, right now, every, every month, we're more than seven million people are reading our stories, you know, the Miami Herald. And at the heyday, you know, if we had like 500,000 subscribers, that was it. You know, now you're, you're sh getting your story shared throughout you know, the world and I think our reach is greater and there's a lot of opportunities for young journalists who, who really want to work hard and want to make a difference. You know, in our newsroom, uh, we have hired a lot of young journalists who are really kicking butt and, and doing great work and, and I think that there's still room for everyone to continue doing what they're doing and, and certainly don't give up on your dreams. If you want to be a writer, you can be. If you want to be a sports writer, a columnist, a political writer, there are opportunities, and and there are opportunities now more more so than you could have ever expected there would be. Considering again, and I want to say the me the media industry is in turmoil because it is in a way, but it is an opportunity for change to happen. And I think that 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 change is good, and we're going through more changes, and I think it would be for the better. So when you were an 18, 19 year old kid walking, roaming the halls at 1000 building here at Miami Dade College, going with David Mervis to the, I think the printer was in the, in downtown, right? I, yes, I recall, downtown, yeah. You would go with him uh, to look at the mock-ups and make sure everything was fine. Did you ever in your wildest imagination think that you'd be here today sitting as the, as, as the lead guy of the Miami Herald uh, and the Mobile Herald sports page? No, I definitely ne never thought that that would be something that would happen. I mean, I, I'm not sure what exactly I thought I wanted to be when I was 18 or 19. I just knew I wanted to have a job. Um, I wanted to have enough money to, to do what I needed to do uh, with my family to support them. Uh, but as far as what I wanted to do, I wanted to do something that I was in charge of. And I don't know what that was. But that's pretty much the only thing I knew, that I wanted to run something. And now being able to run the sports department, it's, it's, it's a dream. And you, like I said, you've gotten to work with some great people, yes. right? 
t talk to us a little bit about some of the people that you work with um, and maybe have some cool stories. Well, well cool for me, it was, it was, you know, one of the, the fun, funny moments of my life was when I started editing Edwin Pope. <laughs> and it was, it was one of those things that I'm like, wow, I'm editing Edwin Pope, I'm touching his copy. Uh, you know, who would ever thought that I would be doing that? And, and you know, and, and it's just, you know, funny in a way and just exciting uh, when I had to also, you know, edit Greg Cody, even Dan Levitard, you know, great Dan Levitard, you know, and, and you, you realize that everybody has an editor, no matter how great you are. And, and it's, it, it was fun for me to do that. Well, we're going to take another break and we'll be back with Alex Mena. story at MDC. Be analytical. Be imaginative. Be a rising star. Be bold. Be connected. Be the solution. Be ready. What's your story? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your biggest successes and biggest failures, even at the at, at, in your during your career. Things that, and what did you learn from those? Because everyone learns. Everyone always likes to point. And these are the great things that I've done, but I think you learn a lot, probably more from your failures. Not necessarily failures, but things that you don't uh, maybe reach the the, the, the pinnacle that we're expecting. Well, from. to me, one of the biggest successes that I had was when I had to, you know, when I ran the Super Bowl coverage uh, for the Miami Herald for the 2010 Super Bowl in Miami. It's the first time I ever did that, and it was one of the most terrifying things I, ha I had to deal with, you know. Um, I had 30 reporters, wow. you know, at the stadium. I forgot what it was called then. It's changed a few times its name. Yeah. Um, and I remember while I was trying to figure out where everybody was sitting, and, you know, normally because it's the Super Bowl, it's not like, you know, like, like it is when, when they're just playing regular games or in the press box because there's so much media, a lot of the reporters had to see you know, where fans would normally sit. So they set up areas there uh, for Wi-Fi in 2010, which was not as reliable as it is now. Uh, and I remember that halfway through the first quarter, I realized that of the 30 reporters we had there, 27 did not have Wi-Fi. So they had no ability to follow their stories when the game would be over. And uh, for the next two quarters, including halftime, I was dealing with the techs running frantically, can we get this fixed, can we get this fixed, can we get this fixed? And they finally fixed it. And toward the end of the third quarter, I didn't know who was winning. And they asked me, how did you like the halftime show? I don't remember who was in the halftime show because wow. I was too busy uh, dealing with the other stuff that you don't think is part of, of being a journalist, which is making sure that the little things are working, which is technology. Um, being able to run that to me was, was very, very exciting, very, very... Uh, rewarding when it all actually worked out at, in the end. Uh, so to me, I learned a lot about or my organizational skills during that time, having to manage all those reporters, not just you know from uh, from sports, but we had reporters from news, from features, because there were different aspects of the Super Bowl uh, when they're in Miami that uh, you get to cover. Obviously, the Super Bowl is coming back to Miami next year, about 10 years after the the first one I I led. So it's it's. It, it's a kind of a interesting circle that I'm going through. The last time I was the deputy sports editor, and I'll be the sports editor, so certainly it's a little bit of a difference. Uh, one, one of my biggest mistakes I ever did um, when I was a clerk, I ran the wrong day's horse results. And you have to understand that readers depend on the results because they do gambling, and if they throw away their tickets because they have the wrong information, they are not going to be happy. Wow. I actually thought I was going to get fired the next day. <laughs> uh, certainly now it, it seems that it wasn't as big of a deal as it is because in, you know, in, in the media industry, you, know, you mess up one day, but tomorrow you have another chance to make up for it and forget about your mistakes. And I think that's the biggest thing that, that you have to learn, that every day there's a new opportunity 
to fix something that was done wrong or to do it right. Not think about what mistakes you've done in the past, but what can you do better the next day. This was before the whole social media craze. So, before, before, so, so yeah. let's go in a little bit into that as far as like managing social media and having uh, reporters who are now on social media, who are on all the different platforms. Uh, how difficult is that um, to make sure that people don't have their opinion, but also it's a great avenue to kind of reach your readers? No, it, it certainly is. I mean, you kind of expect all your reporters to be involved, you know, in Twitter and, and you know, engaging the readers. You know, people ask questions, you have to, you have to be involved, you know, but you have to also have a sense of respect toward the readers, toward the people who are engaging with you. Um, you can't just kind of say whatever you want because, again, we're, we're professionals. So it, it's difficult because you have to kind of watch what everybody's doing and some reporters are more prolific than others and, and it, it does take a lot of your day to kind of be able to follow what they're all doing and, 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 and it is a lot. You know, and you have to also follow what the competition is doing to make sure that they're not beating you on the story. So the thing about social media is that it really makes it easier for you not to get beat as often because once you find out that they have a story, then you, you have the opportunity react to just to kind of react to it and fix it. In the old days, you only found out when you saw the newspaper the next day and that was too late. <laughs> now you have the opportunity with social media to, to get the thing right the very same day and have the news every day correct, you know, if you can, and you can make corrections too, you know, because when you have the story out, people read it immediately, and, and that's one of the biggest benefits of social media, you, you know, you can correct mistakes much quicker. That's fantastic. Um, talk to me a little bit about the evolution of the business. Where do you see the business going um, in the next couple of years, or even maybe 10, 20 years? Down well, the I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, and you know, feel excited about you know, the changes that, that might be coming, you know, because I think the way that the readers are consuming news is very important and we have to kind of continue providing them the news in a way that makes sense, whether it's on an iPhone, whether it's on a tablet, on a computer, because now people are reading in all kinds of different ways and you have to find uh, technology that will feed the reader no matter where it is that they're finding their news. It could be on, you know, on, 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 on a random, uh, phone app that tells you, hey, there's an alert because you're interested in, in some certain news. So that's, that's what we need to work on to find out how to reach more of an audience than what we have now. And so just so much content out there. I'm a yeah. big fan of uh, the Cincinnati sports teams. So I follow the Cincinnati Inquirer. I follow uh, the Bengals, Reds. Yeah. And the uh, Inquirer has a, has a great, uh, you know, they do great. They do a lot of videos. They do podcasts. They do, they, they, they have their stories and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. So talk to me a little bit about the Herald and what they're doing to kind of reach their readers a little bit more. I mean, we're, we're also doing podcasts, you know, we're, we're, we're doing mailbacks, what we call them, where readers kind of send in uh, questions to our reporters and then you can kind of answer them as much as you can. Sometimes I'll have a reporter go on Twitter and say, all right, for the next 10 minutes, ask me whatever you want and I'll answer you. And that's how we're, we're reaching, you know, readers because they want to know that their questions matter to us and I think it's important. That's the engagement part of it that that is very important to maintain the readership and to have a, a big following. We do podcasts, we do, uh, we've done Facebook lives when it's necessary, depending on what the events are. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing all the things that readers are telling us they want us to do and, and try to do as much of it as possible. So for, for a young person, that's something to take away that they are, there are so many other skills that are involved now. Before, back in the old days, it would just be you sit down, you get your information, you sit down, you write it, and, and it's out. And you said you don't see it, like you said, until yeah. the next day. And now, you know, you have to be able to be a photographer, videographer, and reporter all in one. You know, and like phones make it so much easier now for you to, you know, you, you can't go back to the office and say, well, you didn't take a photo, you didn't mm -hmm. take a video, because we all have capabilities no matter what kind of phone you have now. And that's kind of the, the neat thing about it. And also, it's Catch-22. Well, Alex, again, thank you for being on the show. Uh, we appreciate you having you here today. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll see you soon. Uh, to our, our viewers, thank you again for tuning in, and we'll be back uh, pretty soon with our next episode. Uh, to fo follow any of Alex's work, you can go to MinorHerald.com, and you can read the uh, expensive uh, covers that they have there.